uh, I've always sort of been in um, games and education, that sort of space. Um, so after I graduated from undergrad, um, I had an art degree in undergrad. Um, I was sort of set, or I was trying to position myself as an artist in the game industry, but then somebody, a friend of mine, convinced me that um, there was, my life could be more, more worthwhile than that, and I could help society, and I could, you know, so, so then, so then I started working for Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, um, doing their website, and then also doing flash games for them. Um, when I was there, I sort of realized that, okay, there's a ton of educators here, and we're all sort of working on, on it's basically like curriculum, except it's, you know, in an informal environment and everything, except no one there had, um, instructional design experience. Um, so the, the designers were all, like, designers, you know, like, from industry designers. Or like me, who you know, just you know, art degree, right? And so, um, and so, uh, I was like, oh, I should go to graduate school and get an instructional design degree. So that's what I did. I went to UW um, as a master's to get a, in education, to get a, in educational technology, to get an instructional design degree. But then when I, when I was there, so this is about 2003, uh, Jim G's book came out, "What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy." Um, while I was reading that, I was also playing Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. And um, in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, there's the prisoner's dilemma, which is this classic model from game theory, which is, you know, two of you are criminals, you're both caught by the law enforcement, and, um, you know, you're sent to jail, and they interview you separately and, you know, ask you um, if you rat out on your friend then we'll let you go for free and, and you know, you're, we'll send your friend to jail, right? But they tell your friend the same thing. And if you both rat out, then you'll both go to jail, right? But if you both keep quiet, you'll still both go to jail. We have enough evidence, but you'll go for jail, to jail for a shorter term, right? So this prisoner's dilemma, we're like, do, um, my choice um, is like, okay, do I go, to, do I go away scot-free or do I go to jail? Um, you know, or, you know, things like that, right? So, um, so that was in this game. You know, I learned that in psych, like psychology class in, in undergrad, right? So I saw that in the game and I was like, wow, these guys like int are introducing sort of these you know, sort of academic concepts in games. And um, I was playing, I played the game twice, once as a light Jedi and once as a dark Jedi. I made the same decision at that point. Um, so it didn't matter what my morality was, I mean, the, the outcome was the same, which was I didn't betray my friend because as a light Jedi, you know, I was a good guy, I wouldn't betray my friend. As a dark Jedi, um, I thought, well, if I betray him now, I can't use him in the future, you know? So, so it became suddenly like, um, I just became really, really fascinated about modeling other game theory things in games. Um, and exploring morality and exploring a role playing and and um, these decisions that I was making weren't what the game theorists would call rational. And so you know, ec all economics and everything is all based off of this game theory stuff. And so and if and it's all under the assumption that people are acting rationally, people are making the self interest choices. But I, you know, I didn't make that choice even as a bad guy. And so um, so I became really interested in in in, in looking at morality and role-playing games and everything, and then, you know, I read Jim's book, and it was like, wow, like, there are people in education who are really interested in games now. And I know a lot about games, because I play games all the time, and so I was like, I, I really need to get into this area. Um, I have a voice to say, um, as someone who knows games really well. And so, and so I became a PhD student. Um, my dissertation, I graduated last year, my dissertation was on a World Warcraft uh, rating group, and how they learn to collaborate and do teamwork uh, together online. I never really considered myself a science educator, right? And, and now I'm working on STEM games. And um, uh, yeah, I do, I mean, I do eventually want to go back to more humanistic, more artistic explorations through gameplay of uh, really difficult decisions, you know, um, and really morally ambiguous decisions uh, and, and, and things that to, I think, um, they can be uh, sort of a, a vehicle to cause players to reflect about who they are, um, what kinds of choices they make in their everyday life, you know, um, and, and, and sort of be a mirror. Um, um, but also, but more than that, also just a sandbox where I think they can try out uh, different things that they, you know, like in Star Wars, in that Star Wars game that I was playing, I played multiple times because I wanted to see different endings. Um, I wanted to see 
different ways that the, the story could take uh, shape. And um, you know, I think games do that really, really well. Um, so I want to, I want to, you know, sort of go back to um, designing games. I used, so I used to design games, but but instead of focusing on science and math, focus on art and and you know being human. Uh, Twelve young scholars <laughs> who are really interested in how digital media is sort of affecting society now and, and how learning can be transformed by digital media got together um, to basically share ideas with each other and also meet a bunch of people who are more senior scholars and get really good feedback on our projects uh, from those more senior scholars. Um, it's been tremendously helpful and, and we're, Mimi Ito described it as um, we're building you know, a community here, um, and, and, and um, you know, the relationships here are going to last probably our whole academic careers now, you know. Um, so Sean McCarthy was one of the first presenters on the first day, and he, um, it's kind of funny is that, so one takeaway is that, uh, you know, we all had to read each other's papers before meeting this week, and, um, you know, they were all academic papers, right? Um, and, um, you know, a lot of fantastic papers. Uh, but when you actually see um, through visuals, uh, so for example, in Sean's presentation, the context in which the writing is about. So he was talking about this uh, small city in Texas um, with um, very, like, um, I guess sort of typical rural American city type of um, trappings, and and you know it's got you know low economic um, um, uh, you know it's being hit really hard by the economy, economy problems right now, right? And and it has a pretty high um, or or disproportionately high um, um, rate of poverty and things like that. And and just seeing these visuals and him being able to describe the setting was really you know, and it, and it sort of brought, it made the uh, writing uh, much more real, you know, um, much more contextual, much more, wow, there's this really, uh, you know, like bone deep, almost, like problem in America in a lot of places. And, um, and we're doing really, really good work to try to, to try to get at that. But the takeaway is like, how do we, how do we share that with other people, you know? If it depends on this visual representation that Sean did, you know, then does the academic writing serve the purpose that we really want it to be serving, right? And so, so I think it makes me uh, try to sort of reimagine, so how do we reach the most people and how do we be most impactful, I guess, and, uh, with different ways of presenting our findings? I would be crazy not to try for it. Uh, there's all these people who I would love to meet, you know, and I would be crazy not, you know. Plus, I mean, the opportunity to get them, you know, like one-on-one, -on -one, um, you just don't get that at a conference. Uh, you know, you have like five minutes at a conference. I, I've, you know, so I've met several of them before at conferences. So like Drew Davidson, for example. Um, and, you know, they're the nicest people at conferences, but you can't really say much in five minutes, you know. So it's been really rewarding there.